Welcome to Uncommon Sense, where we do our best to make it common again. I'm your host, Adrian Alquist, and today I'm joined by John Walker, who is an actor. He's acted in film, television, and theater, and he's worked in Hollywood and New York, and he's worked with award-winning directors. And most importantly, he has portrayed G.K. Chesterton in a one-man play on EWTN. Uh, and uh, you might, if you're watching on YouTube, you might be able to see the resemblance a little bit. <laughs> now I, I started to see it <laughs> in a good way. Um, and and uh, he's a professor at the a professor of theater at Franciscan University. So how are you, John? I'm good, thank you. I'm in the middle of summer, so I uh, suddenly I'm reading books I, I I put on the shelf, and I'm thinking about other things. And getting ready to go down to EWTN, I guess, uh, uh, to film some episodes with, of GK. So. Oh, great, yeah. Um, well, I'm definitely going to ask you about that and what drove you to take up the mantle of G.K. Chesterton. Mm. Uh, but first, uh, I'm going to announce some exciting news about our conference. Uh, I've been I've been touting the conference for a while now on the podcast, uh, and it's happening on July 29th to 31st this summer in, in Chicago. Uh, but the exciting news is that Seth Dillon, the CEO of the Babylon Bee, is coming to speak at our conference. And it's very exciting for us. I'm sure a lot of people... Uh, a lot of you know about the Babylon Bee. It's a satirical news source. Um, and uh, if, if you don't, definitely look them up because they're very, very funny. I, I, we were just talking before, before this, uh, John. You, you've seen it, right? You've, you've yeah. read it, at least. Yeah, yeah I, I was looking at it last night. The, a T-ball story absolutely cracked me up. <laughs> That's great. And you're coming also to the conference, right? Yes, I am. I absolutely wouldn't miss it. Great, great. Yeah, so everyone, please go to chesterton.org slash conference to sign up. Uh, you can enter in the podcast, the, the promo code podcast one zero to get uh, $10 off. If you're not a member, if you're, if you're a member, you get an additional discount. Um, and so, yeah, let's, let's get into it, John. Okay. Uh, so can you give us a little background on your acting career? You know, who you've worked with, what draws you to acting? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it's, I look back on my, my, my biggest time of my success was in the um, mid 80s to the late 90s. So now that's beginning to look like ancient history. Isn't it like a car when a car gets to 25 years, it automatically gets antique plates. <laughs> so it, it, it almost, you know, there comes a point now when I talk about my work and there, I mention actors or directors and everyone goes, who? So um, I worked with, uh, sure, I worked with Academy Award winning directors like Norman Jewison, Sidney Lumet. I worked with uh, Tony Award winning directors like Eric Simonson, um, Will Smith, Dan Aykroyd, just a, a whole cavalcade of famous people at one point or another. Um, I, I kind of jumped right into uh, film work right after grad school because I was being screen tested at um, Disney and Paramount for a couple of things, but they didn't know what to do with me because I was so tall. I'm um, six, four and a half. Uh, hey, Chesterton's height. Uh, yeah. Which came in handy later. Um, <laughs> um, so I, yeah. And then, then I did theater. I did a lot of Shakespeare festivals from new England back to Los Angeles because that's, that was my first love. Um, and so uh yeah, I, I, I was in Hollywood for about, uh, I guess, 15 years. Um, I just never, ever felt really comfortable there. Uh, I don't know. It probably was just me. I'm a New England guy, and I like Four Seasons. I don't think it's just you. I, I, think, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I think it's surprising that it didn't spit you out. Well, <laughs> there was a time. I mean, um, every actor, when you're coming up um, and you're a working actor, there, there comes a time when you, you get to a point where they start throwing bigger fish at you and bigger parts. and um, and generally, the way auditions go, you'll get your lines, but you won't see the final script till five auditions down the road when the, your agent is talking about your contract. And that's maybe when you see the whole script. And we got to one point where there was a script that came across the boards. So we got through the five auditions and we were in the, the money phase. And they sent me the script by messenger and I read it and I went, I, I can't, I can't do this. You know, and I called my agent and she said, I got a problem. She says, is this a Catholic thing? I said, well, yo, I, yeah, I think so. And she goes, <laughs> oh, that's bad. And I went, yeah, yeah, I think it is. So she was totally in favor of it. But she let me know, you know, you're going to get blackballed for a little while um, in this city anyway. So, you know, I just said no, because uh, we hadn't had kids yet. But I just knew when we did, I couldn't have that stuff on YouTube or something. So when we moved back to New York and I became a big hit in cop shows, we, we wrote it out in a different city for a while. Um, but yeah, it was, the career was good. It started in theater. It started with Shakespeare. It, it landed into television and film. I'm not quite sure how, I mean, it's, 
it's so accidental and arbitrary sometimes. And I think that's really frustrating with actors because they say, you know, it was just a lucky chance. I bumped into so-and-so and met that person. And it really is true. But, you know, the, the thing of it is you have to be ready when you get that opportunity. It's like a baseball metaphor. You know, you can work out and train and swing the bat all the time. And one day you will get a perfect pitch. But if you haven't prepared for that, um, you won't be able to hit away. I mean, Hamlet was right. The readiness is all. So uh, I guess, uh, yeah, some of my uh, work was based on luck and chance encounters. And, and I was just lucky enough to be ready to, to perform when I got the chance. Yeah. So. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not surprised that Hollywood asked you to compromise your morals, basically, and you had to get out. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, I hate to be the one who jumps on that bandwagon, um, but I found it happened more than once in my career. And uh, it was just tough, uh, especially when I had a kind of I was kind of famous for cop shows and they would find some really gritty uh, movies and topics to cover. And I was just like, you know, no, nah, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I, just, I can't. I can't pervert the art that filmmaking and storytelling should be. Right, you know? exactly, yeah. Well, yeah. it's good they had fun while it lasted, at least. <laughs> well, we, you know, we made our income, we paid all our bills, we bought a house, we paid our cars, all our health insurance. It all came from either the Screen Actors Guild or the Ac Actors Equity, which is the Stage Actors Union. Mm -hmm. So we which had a great more, ride. Well, which is more than more. most actors can say, even if they do compromise their morals. So <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, had a, I have a lot of friends who are still in the profession finding their way through it. And we always said, I mean, I was really grateful I got a couple acting awards from the LA Times and theater. But the thing is, if you can pay your bills and pay your rent from acting, you, that's it. There's nothing. That's the success ratio. That's less than 2% of the union. So, so you know. Yeah, yeah. You. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's, that's good. And um, so something I didn't mention in your introduction was that you wrote a book called Chasing Chesterton, An Actor's Journey in Faith. And yeah, you could call it a book. <laughs> is it what, what should i call it a comic book it could be a, a coloring book. book if i had more pictures in it um <laughs> I, I i i always you know especially speaking with you um you whose father is dale you know I, I i there are people who write books all right they're like joseph pierce they're like dale alquist they're kevin o'brien nancy brown um they're actually writers they're actually authors they're actually scholars i think joseph Pierce is the record for writing a book every hour or maybe it's every day. <laughs> um, so, you know, <laughs> when I think of this uh, little pamphlet that happened, um, and, you know, it just, I always get a little knee jerk because, um, you know, I, I'm not a writer. I, I'm an actor and I write scripts, but um, a book was something new for me. And uh, it was a problem was I kept telling people I was going to do it, you know? You know how you throw up test balloons? Well, I kept telling people, well, I'm going to write this book about Chesterton. I'm going to write about how I discovered him and how I made this one man play and how it came about. And they'd say, oh, that's a great idea. Or they'd say, oh, really? You're going to write a book? <laughs> so I would go around to the entire Franciscan community till I had told everyone this thing. I would, they would see me come and go, yeah, John, you're going to write a book. Um, and just to see what, how their reaction was. And then it came to the point where I, I kind of had to do it. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so it it came about um yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll bring it to the conference maybe i'll sell a couple but um you I don't should know. you it, should i get a little nervous <laughs> no i i think uh i don't think you have to be a scholar to write a book i i think sometimes obviously. scholars are overrated <laughs> <laughs> but no um so so obviously I, you should probably be in my name is lazarus i've interviewed a lot of people whose conversions were influenced by gk chesterton yeah and that's sure. obviously at least, I mean, Chesterton has influenced your faith. And Huge I'm wondering, influence. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I so, mean, my conversion was before that, um, but it, it grew in it grew in deeper and more stronger roots because of my connection with Chesterton, which I didn't expect at all because I didn't I didn't know who he was. You know, I didn't know who your dad was. I didn't know who the associate. I didn't know any of this stuff when I first landed on him. Okay, wow. Okay, that's that's good to know. Um, yeah. And so, what? What did having being an actor have to do with it? Uh, I started in high school. Um, you know, I made little Super 8 movies and stuff. And I, I, I was kind of a loner of a kid, uh, kind of weird. And I, I wanted to uh, have a group to hang out with. And I remember my sister, who used to paint sets for the drama club in high school, had so many friends. I thought, wow, that's really a cool community, you know, that, that comes together like that over, over this silly production stuff. So the only problem was in high school, you had to audition for the first play in order to be on tech. So I auditioned and I ended up getting the lead in um, this Shakespeare play, which was terrifying, but I, I, I loved it. I had never which felt Shakespeare anything play? like that before. 
I don't really care too much about, I mean, the performance aspect is great because that's when you have the acting community and the tech community and the audience community coming together in a Trinity, you know, yeah. um, which, which, which uh, no accident, which Shakespeare play was it uh, as you like it. Okay. Yeah. And um, so, you know, but, in the rehearsal, the process of creating it, that's my favorite part. It's great to get it to a show stage, but then it kind of stays at, at this place. The, the collaborative process of creating theater is the part I really love. Mm -hmm. And so I just fell in love with it. And it turned out I was kind of good with it. And I just kept doing it. Um, and I never looked back. I knew at 15 that that was it. That was who I was going to be one way or the other. Yeah. I, I where, Have you been in Macbeth? Oh, Mackers. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I don't, I don't, I, it's terrible. Um, it's just tradition though. It's not super stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been in Mackers. I've been, uh, I've played, uh, Macduff when I was younger, I played Malcolm. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I, I got to I star clear of that. What I mean, cause Shakespeare had some stuff going on when he wrote that. I mean, he had King James, <laughs> the guy who wrote the handbook on how to catch witches come down from Scotland to become King. And he wrote a play about a Scottish King who listens to witches and destroys his life. I mean, so Shakespeare, you know, he knew what he was doing when he wrote that. Wow. I didn't know that. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Really so, cool. um, so there's a lot of stuff. There, there, there's always the story of the curse, but you know, yeah, there's I, all sorts you... of stories about theater. Don't whistle backstage because <laughs> in the old days, if you whistled birds would nest in the thatch and they poop on the audience. So, you know, right. there's all that stuff. Have the, you the read, reason there's um... so many accidents in Macbeth is because they do it with candles and lanterns and people trip, I think. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. Have you read Joseph Pierce's, uh, any of his work on how Shakespeare, uh, yeah, he Catholic. was crucial. In fact, I forced him to be my friend. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know how he'd look at it, but back when I was working at a monastery and um, raising goats and cattle and whatnot, um, I, uh, I I read his book upon, about the annotator, uh, about Shakespeare's discoveries, of that, the kind of discoveries of Shakespeare's works and things in his personal life that really led to him being a, a Catholic. And I was fascinated by that. So I wrote to Joseph Pierce after I read one of his books and asked him for other books to read. Oh, and cool. he wrote back. And so for a little while there, I could walk around and go, yeah, I talked to Joseph Pierce today. He said, this book's pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, I had, I, I, I read most of his stuff on it. I think he's dead on. And I've quoted him in classes all the time. It's, uh, you know, th there's a lot of stuff. We, that'd be a whole other podcast of how yeah. you can follow Shakespeare's Catholicism and why he lived such a quiet in the background life in a police state, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. I, I only asked about Macbeth because I got to star in that when I was a uh, senior in high school and I got to, you know, be Macbeth. And that was intense. That was probably my favorite play that I was in for sure. Um, but I lost, you know, more than 20 pounds doing that. That play. I was already a skinny freshman. <laughs> That's what I should do. I should do it then. <laughs> yeah. No, you're it's fine. You have to, play. you have to keep being Lear. I'm really a big fan of Lear. Um, and of course, Hamlet, I, I, I got that one when I was really young, like 23. And that was, and I just happened to get such a great director that I, my mind just opened on the way to work the text and the way to look for clues in the text to how to perform it. So gotcha. Shakespeare is like, you know, it's like Chesterton. You can't read enough. You can't do it enough. Yeah. It, it will always improve every time, you know? Mm -hmm, for sure. I agree. Um, okay. So, uh, you decided to take up the mantle of playing Chesterton, uh, as we just mentioned. And so why, what, why did you do that? What, what drew you? I don't know. To make that I, decision? Tired. <laughs> I made a bad, no, made <laughs> you a made bad a bad decision. decision. Well, I was, I, we had left um, the city um, and I, we were in Vermont and we'd moved up to Vermont so I could be close to my folks because they were getting older and I wanted to be there to help them out. And I wanted my kids to have some clean, fresh air and not live in these cities that my career dictated. And I wanted to do some teaching. I was really tired of the places my career always went up to. And then I had to say no. Mm -hmm. So we were in Vermont. And of course, after a few years of directing theater and stuff, I was like, gosh, I really miss acting. I, and I thought about, you know, I'd written a one man show before for somebody else. And I had seen some great, a great one man show on C.S. Lewis on um, past watchful dragons, I think in, in London. And I thought, you know, I really need to do a one man show. I, I just got to figure out who to do it on. Um, and so I began researching ideas of characters to write. You know, it's great. I love the research process. That's probably one of the things I love about acting. You know, you it's like a detective. You walk into a room and from all these clues, you try to put together a character. Well, I, you know, I could research a one man show for the rest of my life and never do it. And that would be great. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the role I was on. Um, and one day when I was checking out of the library, I, I picked up a uh, Father Brown mystery because I, I, I love mysteries. 
And I read it and I was so impressed how it was finally a story where the priest wasn't some buffoon, some local hmm. cleric who's just kind of bumbling. And I thought, wow, that's really neat. I should, I should read some more of those. And I looked, of course, you know, who wrote it. I said, okay, G.K. Chester. And I wonder who he is. Maybe he's written some other things. <laughs> um, and so that was, that was it. I went online to type in, you know, GK Chesterton, who is he? And I saw, you know, six and four, six and five, 300 pounds. I said, okay, I'm pretty close to both of those. Uh, I'm <laughs> definitely that height. I'm, I will be that weight. Um, sword cane, uh, pistol, cape, hat, uh, put on plays, puppet shows and prolific and Catholic. And, and my, it just, my mind started to explode because I, I hadn't, I hadn't discovered him yet. And that suddenly occurred to me, oh, you know what? I, I could maybe be G.K. Chesterton for a one-man show. All I got to do is read everything he's written. <laughs> that, that's dangerous. That's <laughs> Which I soon found out was an impossible task. <laughs> um, but um, I think what, you know, if, because at first you're just enraptured with the genius. Um, and on all fronts, from poetry to cartooning, you know, from theology to storytelling to, I mean, just on so many levels, you're kind of mind boggled by that for all, for like a year. And then, you know, the idea comes of, well, how, if I could write a play that showed people who he was behind those words, the man who might weep, um, thinking about the fact that he couldn't have children, the man that laughs at his own jokes just before he says them. You know, that if I could find out who the guy was behind these amazing words and paradoxes, maybe that's the guy I could play. And there's an acting thing that is more in depth about character study than it is about just, you know, memorizing. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I, he's, op he's, I don't know, I don't know a lot of people who are operating on that level, but he's certainly, you know, he's operating on a level that I, I don't even come close so a different level yeah <laughs> yeah i had yeah. to find a way to get into his head and figure out who he was so i think that's what led me to do it and then there's the more i studied the more i was like you know i think i i think i could do it but my idea was to maybe because i hadn't seen chuck chalberg yet i haven't seen your dad's show i didn't have tv in vermont i had you know rabbit ears um so i didn't know and I, if i had seen that i might have not done it because i would have said well it's been done he's it's already done, done. yeah yeah I'm glad um, you didn't see it then, but uh, other people should see it. The The Apostle of Common Sense. Oh, it's it was, brilliant. It's yeah, brilliant. It's I, met, I was lucky enough to meet Chuck in Kansas City, and I was a little afraid to speak to him because by then the Golden Key had come out on EW10. But we had the best time talking about history, and he's just a marvelous guy. He paid me a really great compliment, too, about um, my Chesterton being, you know, an actor's, really an actor's portrayal. Um, and that, that, that just was amazing coming from him. But, but anyway... Uh, yeah, by the so way, I started doing the research and putting it together and piece by piece uh, with that idea of being the man behind the words it started to sink in. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and just to clarify for people, the golden key is the title of the one man show that you did as Chesterton. Right. Yeah. The golden key is the title. It, uh, you know, I went down to film a Saints versus Scoundrels uh, as Chesterton. Ben Weicker, who does Saints vs. Scoundrels, he roped me into doing that. And he said, look, you want to play with Chesterton? You talk about the one-man show all the time. Why don't you test drive him? And I was like, ah, because if I do that, I may have to do it. And I find out I'm really <laughs> not good at it. Yeah. So I went down and I did it. And he, <laughs> I had a beginning and an end to the golden key. I had very little in the middle. <laughs> and he went up to the executives at EW10 and said, hey, you should talk to John. He's got a great one-man show on uh, Chesterton called The Golden Key. And they said, oh, we hear you've got a great play. And I said, oh, yeah, 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 that's sort of kind of. And they said, well, you know, send us a copy as soon as you can. And we'll take a look at it. And I, for some reason, and I'm not a very fast writer, uh, I wrote seven drafts in seven months. It had uh, seven drafts in seven weeks. It had to be like the Holy Spirit. You know, that's all mm -hmm. I can think. Gotcha. So I turned it in. They liked it. And they said, look, instead of you doing it at parish halls and, and little little places in no middle of nowhere or not doing it because of being so lazy how about we film it here on ewt and make it a, a special episode a special series so i jumped at it you know because i i didn't know if i'd ever get to do it really so that's and how so without without about. spoiling too much uh what is it about other than just you know chesterton what what is the specifics of your one-man show on chesterton well you know i had to find a way to have a reason for him to come out and talk to an audience. You know, I couldn't just have him come wandering out going, oh, hello, I forgot where I am. You know, I had to, had to have something. Um, and I thought, you know, I was reading The Great Divorce and it occurred to me, what if, what if GK died? And after he died, where did he go? 
I mean, what if God in his all-knowing mercy, love, and wisdom decided that, you know, GK should have a place of comfort to kind of get the transition in his head? And what would that be? Market Harboro? It's a beautiful little town, beautiful little train station. He spent time in it before. And what if that happened and he ended up there and through the course of being there, he had to unpack his suitcase and go through his voluminous pockets to try to find a reason why he was there. And in doing so, find articles and items that reminded him of his life. And so as it goes, he starts to realize something's different about where I'm at. Maybe he would come to terms with his life and leaving it. And then that would be the show. And that way he could unpack his life at the same time. So that's sort of how the show came about and how it became. That's sort of the format of it. Anyway. That's really clever. That's a very clever idea. Well, yeah, it's C.S. Lewis's, you know, it's his <laughs> idea. And yeah. probably a few others before me. But it really was interesting to, to write it that way. Yeah, um, yeah. That's cool. Well, I encourage everyone to go. And can you buy it? Can you buy the, the series? Yeah, you can or... buy the DVD at um, EWT. And they might be airing it again because once we filmed it, they said, um, would you be interested in making this into a TV series? And I said, well, what would we call it? And they said, oh, it could be Chesterton Station and maybe other people who have died that he might know are coming through and he has to help them with their transition. <laughs> I was like, yeah. okay, yeah, I think that could be okay. So we wrote a couple scripts and they liked it. I'm going down in three weeks to film an episode with George Bernard Shaw visiting the station and um, Robert Louis Stevenson. <laughs> cool. Shaw and I just argue all the time, dressed as cowboys. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Because we're going off to film for James Barry. And Robert Louis Stevenson has a, a, a different, he's he's dealing with the duality between, in every man, between. Yeah, and all yeah. Stuff. Gotcha. So anyway, uh, yeah, I think that's going to start airing. And they probably will show Golden Key again, just to sort of boost the interest because we lost our production during COVID, like everybody else, everything else canceled. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's really cool. Um, is there anything else you want to say about about that and your experience being Chesterton and your experience with Chesterton? Uh, then I'm going to ask you about about another uh, question about the connection between acting and and Catholicism. And that's, I've asked this to my other uh, interviewees on um, on the podcast. The but... thing, you know, I've played a lot of roles and a lot of plays. I've played a lot of villains in movies and in theater, Shakespearean villains at that. And, you know, my wife would always say, when is this play going to be over? Because <laughs> you are just not nice to have around in this guy. I don't like this guy. And um, she's never said that since I've been playing GK. And, you know, there's something about the joy, the simple joy. You know, I tell my students, next time you go out and you're walking across campus and you're looking on a phone, turn off your phone for a second. Look at the ground. What do you see? Well, I saw a dandelion. Today. I said, well, there you go. That's a love letter from God. That's so that's a beauty, a piece of beauty he put there just for you. Uh, there's a joy and a, a, a wonder and a marvel at things that are that we normally pass by that really hooked me about GK. And that really changed. I think that was the faith journey that really got boosted by by spending time with him and playing him was yeah. joy. You know? I, I agree. And that's what we try to emphasize at the society. Uh, and I said this a lot of times. We want to renew the world through joy, through Christian joy. Uh, yeah. And common sense, but partly, you know, part of this the purpose of this podcast. But, but, um, but we also try to emphasize that at our schools, uh, we want to instill joy in all of the students because um, yeah. it, can, it can be really easy to get just overburdened and burned down by the world. Especially, you know, I, I'm sure people can relate to that just with everything that's happened this last year. But yeah, everybody you, can sure. But but joy is is an act of the will. Joy is is acting um you know it's not it's not fake acting like this is actually related to what we're talking about it's not right. it's not a f fake it, it is actually an act of the will to to be happy and to be joyful yeah it's it, you, you are in control of your perspective and you can you know choose to to let yourself be overwhelmed by stress but you can also choose to disconnect and find ways to see beauty still in the world you know i mean beauty is the most powerful transformational thing that's the that's beauty, truth, and goodness. I mean, that's it, Lubach looked at the rose window at Notre Dame and converted. So, you know, <laughs> nice, that's yeah. a big part of being able to be aware of the beauty and the wonder around you. And it may not be a stained glass. It may be the gift of the dandelion. So it, it's a it's being able to be in touch with that part too, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's cool. So, so yeah, I mean, as we kind of touched on acting in this world, in our country, in our culture has kind of been hijacked by you know, secular notions and stuff like that, but yeah, it's not fair at all. 
Okay. <laughs> well, it's well, like I the wanted... Romans. We're back at the Romans. You know, they, the Romans took all the romance out of it and turned it into like crowd control and bread and murder. And then, so the holy the Holy Roman Empire comes over and says, "Hey, you know what? No more theater. You do theater, you're excommunicated." <laughs> um, so we've been there already, but we're not doing that now. We're not excommunicating people for perverting the art. Well, but, right. You know, and that's the, that's what I wanted to ask was was what there is something Catholic about theater. The Catholic so... Church brought it back. Yeah, it's our birthright. I mean, every time you go to Easter and you have the priest read Jesus and the lector read uh, the narrator or um, or Pontius Pilate and the crowd, the parishioners read the crowd, you're reenacting a piece of liturgical drama, mm-hmm. you know, from the Middle Ages. Um, they came back in 639 with um, the Benedictines writing Quim Quertus, the uh, three women at the at the tomb. And liturgical drama was so big. I mean, St. Francis of Assisi, you know, with the nativity play, um, that it had to move out of the church and into the streets. And then people in the community got together to put these plays on. You know, the butchers did the passion because they had all the blood and the guts and the, the goldsmiths did the, the magi and they tried to outdo each other. And then the pageant plays would come where people could walk through the town center and watch these plays. And they were in the vernacular so people could follow it. So where they couldn't keep up with the Latin, the average Joe and his wife and kids could watch the play on stage in front of them. We brought back theater the catholic church brought it back um that's really cool so yeah. it's really ours you know yeah yeah and it's no, been I, around for you know i don't know eight million bazillion years ever since the two cave and og and nog were sitting around the fire saying no <laughs> you play the mammoth i'm going to be the hunter in this show for the you know we got the fire up and everyone's watching so no just be careful with the spear because every time we do <laughs> yeah it, yeah yeah no that's that's really cool yeah that's, that's a good take on it um i also want to ask you what you thought was chestertonian chestertonian about acting and i have an idea if if you don't, but I, I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, I thought about that too. Um, because Chesterton loved theater. I mean, from his toy theater, which was like the first image in his memory, a scene in that, to puppets, to dressing up with friends, to you know, there was something joyful that he loved about doing theater for other people and for himself, and it, it had a huge impact in him. I I I don't, you know, I I, I don't know. But I, I have a feeling that he understood the the role of the theodrama and how that we are actors in a creation made by another director, another playwright, and that we have to listen to our director to be able to live in that theodrama. I mean, we're made in his image. Yeah. So that means we have a longing to create. Now, whether it's creating the Rose Window or a beautiful play or a schedule that gets everybody that their soccer match back home in time to have dinner, which is a masterpiece of logistics itself, we are we are made to create. And in theater, you know, we literally make the word flesh. We literally take the word off the page. Um, and there's no accident that there's a parallel there on a sub level, of course. Um, and I, I think Chesterton understood that. I think he, I think he got that. And I, 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 I yeah, yeah. you know, the, I think he got that. And yeah. um, but what's that, yours? That, I want to hear yours now. Yeah, that makes sense though. This, this came to me recently, so it might be very wrong and too impromptu, <laughs> but, but no, I, I think um, we were, we were touching on the fact that Chesterton lets us look at something in a new way. I mean, just looking at the dandelion and, and, and you can write a poem about it or, or right, yeah. present something on the, on just that. Um, I think I think uh, acting allows us to look at ordinary things in a new way. You can present a story or or just a everyday thing in a, a very romantic way. And I think if if actor if you know theater people aren't careful, they're only going to do what they're familiar with and write a story about acting. And it becomes too uh, recursive, and all their stories just is about acting. And it's a very big temptation for for act- actors and writers to go in that direction. Uh, but Chesterton shows us no. We can we can look at everyday things that uh, that nor, you know ordinary people that aren't actors can can look at and and bring something to their lives. So that's that might be a, a thought. <laughs> no, that's a good thought. That's a really good thought because the power of theater comes in that transformational moment. I like to call it the pin drop moment, where the audience, where all three of the communities, the trinity of communities, there are all zeroed in on what's happening on stage, and it's so intense at that moment that. There's like a circular physics thing of belief going around and everybody's very quiet. There's no programs yeah. rustling. There's no car keys looking for. Um, 
I remember I was working with an actor a long time ago, and he said, if they walk out of the theater and they go straight to their cars, we didn't take them anywhere. If they walk out of the theater and they can't find where they park their cars, they had a transformational moment. <laughs> yeah. And that transformational moment, that, that that's the bridge between the earthly realm and the divine. Mm -hmm. um, if we use that moment right, that's why John Paul wrote the letter to artists. If we use that moment right, I think it, you do see things anew. You do th see things like you've never seen them before. Um, and that's what we should be focusing at is is presenting that moment in beauty, in truth and goodness um, right, right. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not in, you know, just whatever is going to, you know, whatever yeah, is the flavor yeah. of the week. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and so I, I just yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Um, I was just thinking of this funny line in a in a show that I, I watched one time and and this guy decides to all of a sudden be a writer. And, and the, the person, the publisher that he's talking to, she's like, oh yeah, I, I tried to do that once. My story was about a writer who was struggling with depression. And then, and so that's what I was saying. Like, that's what I think a good writer avoids. A good writer can write a story about a chef, even though he's not a chef and it can be, uh, you know, uh, chefs can relate to it, you know? And, and, and so that's, that's something that Chesterton could do. He could, he could talk to, to people and they'd be like, I, that's exactly what I was thinking. And he, he put it into words in a majestic and a magnificent way. Yeah. And he had a love for the common man and a love for, for just the everyday guy, yeah. um, you know, which someone of his genius would, doesn't necessarily have to have, you know, he exactly. was soaring above so many people um, in his intellect, but he, he really had a love of the common experience, you know? And I, I think, um, if you do theater right, if you do it truthfully and honestly, you you can do it in a way that changes people's lives because the main the main power behind theater is empathy. You know, you see in, through someone else's shoes. You see, wow, Mackers, man, don't don't ever play with the Ouija board. You know, you 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 get an idea yeah. about where people are going. Now, that doesn't mean we all have to do plays where people are dressed in burlap sacks and where we're doing Bible stories. It's just we have to play it honestly and truthfully, and we have to do plays that that speak to the good and the true mm -hmm. you know i mean exactly. that's that's what jesus did jesus was the beautiful the divine beauty when he met people he spoke directly to them he, he changed their names he spoke a truth deeply to them and then he sent them off to live the good that's what a theater a play should do it should it through beauty it should transform you in that moment and then speak some sort of individual truth to you that you go out and tell, oh, you got to see this movie or you got to see this play. Yeah, yeah. And, um, that's, and that's, that's, what... that's a vocation. I mean, that's that's something not to be taken lightly. Unless you're doing Lion King on Broadway and you are you can charge $800 a ticket because that's white collar crime, not theater. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but that's that's something that my our parish priest, actually Father Johnson, who who was uh, on the board of our society of G.K. Chesterton, he brought us to, to Rome uh, at Chesterton and he said, this, you know, looking at all the beauty, the, all of the art, um, and they had theater there too. Um, uh, he said, the way we're going to reach people today is through the beautiful, where the, in a world where truth is relative and, and the good is, you know, subjective or whatever, uh, that's what people think. The way to their hearts, to people's hearts, is the beautiful. Absolutely. Bishop Barron said it years ago about how to teach a kid about baseball. You know, give him the rule book or take him to a game. Let him see the beauty of the experience. He'll come home and play it and learn the rules. And that is about as perfect an analogy as you can get. Um, beauty speaks to something so deep inside you that it transforms you. And mm -hmm. um, and it's individual for everybody. Um, yep. So, we, yeah. And it's our birthright. So why not? <laughs> yeah, <You know>? exactly. <laughs> why not rally? I mean, why let other people do God's not dead six? You know, let's, let's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Make some, let's make some stuff. Um, no, I, absolutely. And I'm I'm glad you brought that up because honestly, I, there there has to be a way to present a story that is Catholic but not superficially Catholic. It needs to be it needs to be deeply Catholic. So you know, a lot of my students, filmmakers uh, that come to me and talk to me and say, "Hey, how, I want to be." Catholic filmmaker how do I be a Catholic filmmaker and I would say well back up for a second and why don't you just concentrate on being a really good filmmaker exactly stay true oh, to your yeah, faith exactly you know <laughs> be be faithful and continue keeping Christ yeah. at the center of your life because that's the secret around here at Franciscan just pray right eat right sleep right you'll get out of here okay but concentrate on being a filmmaker be a good artist your Catholicism will come through mm -hmm. your work. There's no way you can disconnect from it. That's really funny um, that you say that because Mark Matthews, who's one of our speakers at the conference. Uh, so another reason you should come, I'm, I'm um, teasing him right now. Uh, he said that 
um, he, he said the same thing about movies and he used the analogy of cars. Someone wants to make a Catholic car. What, how would you make a Catholic car? Maybe you just start by making a good car. Let's, let's focus on that. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the first step. <laughs> So, yeah, it's so yeah. true. And, but, you know, I think we have fallen behind in our evangelization to culture through beauty. I, I, I think we've dropped the reins on there a little bit. I don't, I don't know why I can't point to it. Um, but we've kind of let other people take that road um, mm -hmm. and do things with it and, and succeed at it. But we've always kind of held back. Maybe people are afraid that it's going to change. It's going to become something different. Um, I don't know. But we really need to cash in on that. There's movies films there's a television series i wrote there's lots of things out there that can be done and can can be done easily yeah well I, we I need think, a production company i think um i think the passion of the christ is a good example of a good movie and it is explicitly catholic it's an example of a good and explicitly catholic movie yeah and and that did very well so <laughs> yeah. granted mel gibson had to uh, marketed in a different way. He had to market it to churches. And sure, stuff. I, I go back to Bella in the 1990s, a movie called Bella that was a pro-life movie. And it had tons of Catholic stuff in it, but you didn't really notice that until you were looking for it. And especially Catholics who would be familiar with it. Um, there's a lot of great stories out there. We just need to get production companies behind it and people start make, start doing it. That's really all it is. Yep, um, but there's so many places where that, you know, there's a knee-jerk response to that, you know? Mm -hmm. We're keeping our light under our bushel basket and we really need to stop doing that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, um, John, I, I, that's, that takes me to the end of my questions. Do you, you want to <laughs> say anything <laughs> else about uh, Chesterton or theater? Um, we, we're going to have to have you on again because I, you have a lot of good stories and you like to talk. So <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. I didn't even talk about Balthazar and the theodramatic or any <laughs> communio stuff. And I, I didn't cover the dramatic gesture of St. Francis. And Oh no. Well, Francis we're definitely going to have to have you back on then. <laughs> well, there's just, I mean, we're talking about a topic that, like I said, you know, you, you start off in a library saying, Oh, excuse me, but I found this book on GK Chesterton. Could you show me where some other books are? And the lady takes you over to a door and opens it. And there's this long spiral staircase <laughs> yeah. with volumes up to the ceiling and candles, you know, and there's people still down there eating cheese, trying to read through some. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's a wealth of material that you just, you can't sum up in one thing. And we're talking about some pretty meaty topics about Catholicism and beauty and good and truth and, you know, so yeah, we, there'd be a lot more to talk about. I hesitate in offering any more insights into what I do or <laughs> Chesterton Station or the Golden Key because um, <laughs> I will start enjoying the sound of my voice and you may <laughs> never get out of here. So, um, but well, no, hopefully so I, it'll soon be the voice of Chesterton in people's minds. Although you do have some competition with Chuck Chauberg, um, who's the person who portrays Chesterton on, on on my dad's show <laughs> no competition at all chuck is the first and the original um and i'm grateful that i can follow in his shadow and um if i ever get a chance to do more of it it will be through his uh his acquiescence i guess yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> in fact I, I when i first came out and started doing chesterton and starting to tour the show you know i saw um in gilbert i was reading an article and i saw a picture of you know chuck touring and i just pulled all my advertisements offline for touring my chesterton until chuck you know, said I could. Oh, you know, wow. that, that's nice. That's how, well, that's how much I respect I have for Chuck and for your for your dad, quite quite plainly. That's very cool. Um, well, Chuck Chuck uh, is going to be at the conference and he's going to make an appearance as Chester. Yeah, so, I can't again, wait. I, another reason. You know, it was like I said, if I had seen that when I started writing and working on this character, I might not have gotten there. Um, but I, I might have shelved it, you know, because. Uh, yeah, so I'm kind of glad in a way I didn't I didn't have any access to television at the time because now I can watch that show religiously and go, oh, I'll steal that little one. <laughs> There's wow. a gem they didn't think of. <laughs> Imitation is the best form of flattery, especially in acting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really is. You know, at, at at first I was a little nervous about it, but um, then I got to meet Chuck and we realized, you know, is there too much Chesterton to go around? Is there is there too many ways to access him? No, no. <laughs> so yeah, it's not a competition. It's just another thing. It's another, it's another place. That's all. Nice. Well, yeah. I mean, thank you so much for coming on the show and giving your stories. I, I really do mean we should have you back on because that was great. Great talk. Um, anything thank, for the society, anything for the society. Yeah. Thank you. And everyone member Chesterton.org slash conference, go sign up Seth Dillon. 
Babylon B is going to be there and, uh, and John is going to be here and Chuck Chalberg. So uh, thank you all for listening though. Until next time, help us to make uncommon sense more common.